So b before we start, um, I'll talk a little bit about what we'll go over today. So talk about a little bit about who we are uh, at White Block and what our role is in ETH2, um, challenges to networking in ETH2. Um, we'll go over uh, a recap of the interop lock-in that we had in September um, and what our role was there, um, uh, and a roadmap, as well as a Q&A at the end. So White Block is a team of engineers building tools to test uh, blockchains, distributed systems, protocols, what have you. Um, we have a core product called Genesis. Um, with Genesis, you can fully automate the creation and deployment of a blockchain. You can configure uh, network topologies, uh, deterministically test how they'll react in um, real world and worst case conditions. Um, we can do things like implement a network partition um, to force forking events and see how your blockchain will react and reconciliate that information. Um, and the reason why we're talking about it is because we will use its functionality to test interoperability in ETH2. So here we have everybody's favorite diagram, the um, networking old paradigm, right? So sorry, it's a little messed up. Um, we just downloaded to PowerPoint um, and didn't have time to fix this. But um, we, so you have a client querying a server for information that it desires. Server acts as the centralized point of truth uh, for that information, right? Everybody knows this model, that's why we're all here. <laughs> um, cool, so uh, then you have blockchain networking, which is very, <laughs> very uh, difficult. Um, you have a bunch of nodes in the network that are tasked with challenge to communicate um, over a large network and um, communicate with unknown peers at that. So it gets pretty difficult. In ETH2 specifically, this means that you have uh, nodes receiving messages of blocks and attestations and uh, propagating them to other nodes. Um, and they do this over an asynchronous communication pattern called gossip sub, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, so nodes will receive a message and, and pass it on to their interested peers. Um, and the idea with Gossip Sub is that a message will efficiently propagate throughout the network once the originating node broadcasts it out. So nodes will request information they don't have from other nodes. So if a node has adequate resources, it learns of a new block, um, it will RPC request the, the block or the node that has that information um, to receive it. Cool. So there are a lot of challenges <laughs> in distributed networking. Um, I don't know how aware you are of them, but we've listed very few of them. Uh, uh, but we're actively at White Block looking at these challenges along with ETH2 client teams, ETH2 research teams, and other teams in the space um, looking at them. So there's the issue of peer discovery. Um, how do you as a node find other nodes that you want to talk to in a large network? Um, the issue of distributed hash tables, so DHTs. Um, how do you uh, store information about those peers in the network? Um, there's the issue of security. How do you increase tolerance to certain kinds of attacks that are prevalent in um, distributed networks, like eclipse attacks, what have you? Um, the issue of block and attestation propagation, uh, for which we will use gossip sub. Again, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, the issue of boot nodes in the network, which are points of centralization, perceived to be points of weakness. Um, issue of cryptographic verification, checking to make sure that signatures are valid, um, hashes match um, block information. And then the issue of syncing. So how do, you, um, how do you efficiently sync and securely sync information against uh, other nodes in the network? So I'm sure that you guys have already had like your ears talked off about LibP2P at this uh, conference. It's been like a super hot topic at DevCon. And if you want to go, we're, we're only going to cover it briefly, but if you want to go like more in depth about it, Raul Kripalani from LibP2P um, did a talk about Gossip Sub like two days ago. I'm sure the slides are already up on Twitter somewhere and um, the video will be uploaded, but he did a really good deep dive into Gossip Sub. But we will, um, we will cover just like very basically what um, Gossip Sub does so that we have a base to start off at. So Gossip Sub is an epidemic broadcast protocol. Um, it, it's an implementation of a pub sub uh, communication pattern and it's designed in such a way that um, information will uh, efficiently propagate uh, across the network. So nodes will listen for information that they want um, and pass it on to their peers that want that information. Pattern will continue until all nodes that are interested in that information have received it in, in the network. So Gossip Sub is an efficient uh, protocol for propagating blocks and attestations in ETH2, which is why it's used as the ETH2 networking stack. Um, so back in April, we actually did a few preliminary tests on LibP2P. Um, and they were not so great, um, but again, like Raul mentioned that libp2p is in alpha mode right now, so there are a lot of parts of it that still need to be like 
massaged and, and improved to make sure that um, it's going to be ready for phase zero launch. So um, we at White Block will actually continue testing and auditing um, LibP2P to ensure that it will um, be ready for a uh, successful phase zero launch. So. And I'm, I'm going to talk about that. Yeah, now we're going to talk about testing. Cool. Thanks, Renee. So uh, why are we testing Gossip Sub, right? So the point of this is to really assess the reward performance of uh, Gossip Sub uh, under very adverse conditions, uh, dropping peers, uh, bad bandwidth, uh, packet loss, huge latency between the nodes, knowing that um, in the case of if 2 we have six seconds per block. So if you want to really gossip everything, you would want to have three seconds to gossip the whole information between all the peers so they can decide and start voting correctly on the new block. Um, one thing that um, we can really tweak during that testing is the different network topologies. So uh, if you went to uh, Raoul's talk, he said that you have a minimum of four peers, a maximum of 12. Is that really what we want to go for? Should we have more peers? Should we have a few better peers, should we start uh, working a little bit on some of the work he wants to do for Episub, where we're going to have optimizations, where we're going to prefer nodes which are closer to us, uh, which have lower latency, which are more responsive. We're going to look into that. Um, so to get to work, uh, first thing we did is when we did our pass in April, we used the gold P2P daemon. Um, this time we're starting from scratch with a company called uh, Agency Enterprise, uh, and they're really great. They work really closely with Protocol Labs. So Adam Hanna has been building a LibP2P client, which is based on the Go LibP2P core library. Um, and it's a very simple client that just uh, is going to output a bunch of metadata and information about the message, right? When was it sent? Who sent it? Who is it for? Uh, how many hops do you see for that message? Uh, you know, how long has it been around? Um, what type of, like, how long was the hop between those different peers? Um, we also uh, hired a, an academic on our team who's now doing a literature review to look at the different topologies. Uh, everything should be done there. Uh, naively, right now, we'd like to try also to do some um, discovery, uh, you know, associations so we can do a academic approach to just uh, let the network self organize but it might actually not be the best way to organize the peers. So uh, we're testing all those different aspects. So uh, yeah, talking about network topologies, we're going to strain it, we're going to create a sequence of peers, we're going to create a mesh of peers, just like uh, redundant hubs between each other. So we're going to really see that you know, from node one to 100, we're going to have to traverse all the other nodes to get to that one. So, um, this is in progress. You can check out those two repos. The first one here is our uh, project management repo. Uh, this is all the issues kind of reflect the work from the team. You can take a look. Contributions are very welcome. Uh, your feedback, any issues you see. Um, the work itself, the benchmark tool is actually under agency enterprise. You can take a look at it. You can run it right now. The idea is that we're going to dockerize that work and then deploy it on Genesis. We're going to run you know, 30, 100 of those in parallel. Um, and we had some unexpected good news. Um, I don't know if, if I'm here, but we uh, got uh, access to a, an academic um, facility to run all those tests, uh, something called emulab.net. So uh, we're starting testing actually this week. I got a guy on this. Uh, we're going to publish all the raw data sets for every test suite on Google Cloud Storage. You can download those. Um, they're you know 1.5 gigabytes each, so it's quite a bit of data. Um, and then we'll also share the Python parsing script that we use to read all the logs, to make sense of them, to compile all the statistics, the median, the, all, all this data, and uh, we'll make that open source as well, probably under the, the PM repo. So um, the idea is that we want to be completely transparent, make sure that our work is being reviewed by the community, that if you have an idea or a suggestion for a different type of testing, you can come to us, you can ask us questions, we can have a conversation about this, and we can come together and collaborate on all those things. So um, to switch gears, this is coming a little bit also from uh, our work with Ethereum 2. Uh, so just going to do a little recap on uh, the interrupt workshop that we did in September. Um, here you can see these are stand up in the morning, have Danny Ryan kind of telling us uh, how things are going. Um, we're going by team. Uh, here you have like different teams working together on uh, working on, on the same laptops. Um, so uh, the purpose of Interrupt for us was to establish communications 
between the teams to make sure that they had a good process to work together. Coming into Interop, we just wanted people to just take one laptop, two clients, make them work, and see if they're able to even just gossip a block, say hello, have some information. Um, we had some great tooling from uh, Porto Lambda from the Ethereum Foundation. So he gave us a way to pre-generate uh, Genesis state, like 30 seconds or one minute in the future, that everybody could uh, ingest, uh, as well as the list of validators that would be associated with each client. And then it would give us the ability to very quickly set up uh, this type of scenarios. Uh, you know, initially what the clients did was uh, only one client in the testnet would have validators. Everybody else would be passive and just uh, ingesting all the data. And as we got closer to the end of the week, everybody was able to have validators at the same time. So everybody was producing blocks. We had to get everybody going. Uh, a good caveat of this is that uh, it's a little jury-rigged because we had to kind of go with the flow of those different clients. Uh, some clients did not support sync, for example. So if they started after the Genesis time, they would not have a good time working with the others, right? So it also, to give you an, an idea, it was very manual. Um, they would have uh, a TMAX kind of window at first, start first client, look at the inode of that client, uh, paste that into the start script of the second client, start the second client, start a third client, et cetera, et cetera. Very manual, but you know, for first try, that was, that was a good try, right? So we had a few panics, we had a few interesting crashes. Uh, we saw all the, the things that could go wrong. And uh, well, eventually they managed to get seven clients on laptop, which is uh, a pretty good uh, result. Much better than we anticipated going in. Uh, so, um, yeah, eventually what we want to do now is to actually productize this. So, uh, a recap of the success, we had seven clients talking to each other on a local machine. Um, a little harder for us, uh, we're using Docker, and now we want to productize what they've done into a way that is completely automated. So for us it was a little harder because each client is ever so slightly different, I'm going to go into that. Um, the way we run things with Genesis is that we pretty much take whatever Docker image a blockchain client has, and we just automate its creation and its lifecycle as part of a platform. So it's very easy for us, once everything is in place, to go very quickly to, to a testnet and to just generate many of them. So uh, things that uh, kind of uh, took a bit of time to figure out. Uh, we saw that, um, you know, if it's, even so everybody's using lp 2 p when you have an address for a client for a node in lp 2 p you can do a couple different things. You can have the public key of your client being published to all your peers, or you can choose not to do that. And when they connect to each other, that's when the public key get exchanged, right? So uh, in that case, for example, some clients would just barf because they didn't want to have the public key of the other node in there. So we had to start tweaking for that, like Lighthouse didn't like that, so oh, shoot, we have to change the start script just for them, etc. Uh, we saw also that they have, uh, a different ways of storing the identity key, the key that actually represents the identity of the node. Uh, lip 2 p by default is going to use a protobuf format, which adds two bytes to the beginning of the, the string that we store. Uh, some clients like that as a hexadecimal string being passed, some like that as a base64 string to be passed, and some like that into a file. So we had to account for all those different variances of the, the way they would consume the, the information. All this, of course, uh, works very well when you're doing static peering. Uh, at this point, I think we have two clients that do disk v5, I might be wrong. Uh, so that's something that we will need to look at next. Um, so that we're going to talk a little bit about that quickly. Uh, for us, it was um, kind of a great learning experiment. We're going to generalize our framework to make it much easier to accommodate those, those clients without changes as much as possible. So discovery. Um, I love Discovery v5. I need to make stickers for this. Um, it's a big change from if one. Uh, you know, in if one, you used to have just the URL being broadcasted to all your peers, and you would have those academia buckets where it would be organized. In Discovery v5, you now have the notion of Ethereum node records, which are still signed, are still making sense. It's a little bit of security. You can do a, a handshake, so you can kind of make sure you're not being spammed as much. Um, but what comes with uh, ENRs is now the ability for you to have uh, in those key value pairs you can arbitrarily store in them 
a notion of topics. So you can actually, when you come and you know, broadcast yourself to others, tell that you're an if2 node, or you're an if1 node, or you're a Polkadot node, right? So this allows other blockchains to also participate in a global uh, DHT, this new KWA DHT, which is also simpler than it used to be. Um, so it's going to allow better security, right? So back six months ago, uh, Felix Lange came to New York, and one thing that he mentioned is that this V5 will only work if you have over a thousand nodes running it. Otherwise, the security is going to be compromised by Eclipse attacks very quickly. So um, this is a huge effort. It's going to allow if one and if two to also share some of the work and to share some of the infrastructure. So really excited about this as a network geek. So uh, next steps for us. So we're recipient on the EF grant. Uh, we thank, we thank the Ethereum Foundation for helping us and sponsoring this effort. Uh, we're going to continue working on some of the tests for uh, spec conformance in terms of networking. So we're going to be able to uh, replay traffic, uh, send uh, canned requests, make sure that we're getting the response we expect across all the clients. It's kind of a, at the unit testing level, if you want. Um, and we've been talking long, long last about the LPGP gossip sub uh, testing, so we'll continue auditing that. We want to kind of have a, a, a hand in this, uh, make sure that all the configuration parameters are kind of optimized for the workloads of if 2 uh, And uh, we're pretty close to being able to do a multi-client testnet with all the production-ready clients. So the idea there is that every time there's a new uh, Docker image for Trinity or Lighthouse or Artemis or anything, we can pick that up, insert it into the testnet, try it out, see if it's behaving correctly, um, it's still able to finalize the blocks, all this good stuff. Um, so not to put words into the if two clients um, implementers' mouths, but they are heads down, you know, finishing up all the work, all the details, all the edge cases, all the things that are like, kind of sticking out, really stabilizing the implementations, and uh, we want to help them get the safety that they need to declare a phase zero release. And uh, with that, take all your questions. You're asking how, how things went and how who started first? Is it a, a spec effort or is well, it a... Bit, like, yeah, just a little bit of insight about how, that, how it got to where it is now. Yeah, so it's, it's interesting. So there's been uh, first like some, I mean, they've been talking about if 2 for years, right? So there's a lot of like different initiatives and efforts by Vitalik. Eventually, uh, the research team around if 2 kind of solidified with Danny Ryan kind of helping also get to a point where he could um, name releases of the spec, right? The spec uh, was written by Justin Drake to be more in an executable format, so it could actually become part of the testing. Um, I think Proto Lambda really helped as well to really create testing and tooling around it. And in parallel, all the, I mean, I'm, the, the implementation I'm most familiar with is Artemis, for example, right? And uh, what happened is I had a lot of churn because um, lots of moving pieces came back and forth, right? So SSD, for example, had three or four incompatible designs to each other until the point that they, they agreed on all of this. So every little piece of the spec kept changing as part of decisions down the road. Um, okay, yeah. You mean the network? Networking is not done, I think. Okay. So there are a couple of things in networking. One is the wire protocol, we're getting to a point where we have a good idea. Uh, gossiping is actually pretty easy because you just use gossip sub, you just send all the blocks, all the attestations that you have. So that is not too much of a problem. In terms of syncing, uh, the, the, the teams right now are talking about different syncing strategies. If you're familiar with if one and all the ways you can sync, there are so many ways you can do this. Right? It's still something that is an active research. And uh, our time is up. So yeah, there's more, and there's no RPC interface for if two yet, as uh, Greg mentioned yesterday on this very stage. So, as you're looking at gossip what's your intuition about where there might be further problems? Um, when we did the first round of research, we found that the median time was pretty low and pretty pretty good, but we had outliers which were really really bad. So it looks like the routing strategy is not always optimal. Um, I think that's the only hunch I really have at this point. Okay, so um, how we scale to thousands of nodes in our testing scenarios? Yes, so um, right now what we do is we do small scale testing about 30 to 50 nodes, 
our first lp 2 p testing was 100 and required quite a bit of compute. Right now, we are in touch with that research lab. It's going to give us pretty much infinite resources across the US continent. So we'll see how to go about that. We run Docker containers. So we're pretty agnostic about the underlying hardware. We, you know, we run on virtualized cloud software like GCP, Amazon, Azure. Um, so the idea is we just add more and more machines, about 100 nodes per machine to, to scale to that. Um, we try not to do thousands of nodes. From experience, from practical experience, we certainly know you get already a lot of insights because we can, we can really tear apart all the network connections. Like we can simulate a lot of latency. We can actually have nodes being simulated between New York and Tokyo, for example, to really show what happens if your transaction takes a long time to even come back to you. So um, second part of your question, I'm going to get killed by this guy. Um, <laughs> Yes, he's staring me down. This is terrible.